Hi, everyone. So welcome back to Stage A and uh, next talk this afternoon at EMF 2016. I'm very happy to be able to introduce Beth Healy, um, who's uh, spent 14 months on the South Pole and uh, is going to tell us all about white space and things related to that. So yep, here we are, Beth. Thanks. Thank you very much. So hello everybody, um, my name is Beth and I've just got back um, from Antarctica um, where I was working for the European Space Agency um, doing research for their long duration space flight missions. So just to set things off and give you a bit of an idea of what we're doing down there, um, I'd like to just play this short clip um, which ESA have made. At the end of the world, there is a place so hostile that no country owns it. Explorers call it the last great wilderness on Earth. In artists, it has inspired visions of beauty and of horror, with its stunning vistas and mountains of madness. Here. When winter comes, it lasts for months of unbroken darkness. The air is too thin to breathe normally and drops to minus 80 degrees Celsius. No animals can survive. There is no indigenous population. Anyone trapped here when winter comes is out of reach as no access or rescue is possible at all, be it by ship airplane or helicopter. On life or death, there is no escape from the ice. This is isolation. It is like you are on another world. The story of a lifetime. The story of taking the next step towards the stars. Of leaving this world and gaining another one. For by surviving here at the end of the world, we learn how to survive beyond our home planet Earth. Such as on the moon. or on Mars. The future of human spaceflight is here and now. And it is real. Be a part of the adventure. Hi, my name is Beth Healy, medical doctor for ESA at Concordia Station over the past year. Join me on my adventures in Antarctica and prepare yourself to leave this world. And we're doing loads of different research projects down there, so I can only really cover a little bit of it here in my talk today. So if you guys are interested, a lot more information and also the results which are coming out um, are available sort of on the ESA website. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea of who I am and um, how I ended up going down to Antarctica working for ESA. Um, so I'm a medical doctor and I've got a background of working as part of um, sort of expedition medicine teams. So part of medical logistical support teams for endurance races, um, mainly in polar environments. So I've been sort of North Pole, Greenland, Svalbard, Siberia and places like that. So if there's any med medics amongst you which are interested in that kind of thing, um, come and see me often and we can have a chat about that. 
Um, but while I was at university, I was really fortunate because I got to go to the European Space Agency and learn a bit about space medicine, um, which ultimately led to me getting the job working for ESA down in Antarctica, um, now that I am a doctor. So I was just wondering, does anybody know what a spaceflight analog is or have they got any experience of analog programs? Does anyone? So probably one of the most popular ones and the ones that most people would like to do is to spend um, two months in bed and get paid quite a lot of money for it. Um, but there's loads of different analogs and all of them are good at looking at different things. Um, so for example, you've got sort of bed rest studies, which is looking at the effects of microgravity and not using your muscles for long periods of time. Um, and you've also got other ones like underwater programs, which is like the NEMO project, which is NASA run, and that's mainly used for astronaut training. Concordia is a little bit like Mars 500 in so much that we're really looking at the isolation period. So Mars 500 um, came before um, Concordia and this was a um, 500 day simulated Mars mission um, which was done essentially in a Russian car park. So the crew of six um, people were recruited as you would astronauts. Um, we had a mission control and we did the full simulated Mars mission. And this was really good in loads of different ways, like the research was really well controlled and also the crew was much more similar to a crew which would be selected for a spaceflight mission. Um, but there is one limitation of an experiment like this and that is that um, you do have a door which you can walk out at at any point. And after being down in Antarctica, I think actually I would have found that a lot harder to deal with because if I'd known there'd been a door which I could walk out of at any point, I think I probably would have spent 499 of the 500 days wondering whether or not I should do that. And whereas in Antarctica, because you don't have that option, um, it puts different pressures. And whether it's easier or more difficult, I'm not really sure, but it's definitely a different psychological pressure that you have as a crew. Whereas in Antarctica, during the long polar winter, which is nine months, you're actually completely isolated, even in case of emergency, at Concordia, because the temperatures are so low there that we're not able to fly in during the winter. So this was Concordia, and this was my home um, for 14 months. I just got back in January. Um, it's one of only three of the inland stations in Antarctica, um, and it's up on the Dome Charlie Plateau. It was actually originally built for the ice core drilling, so up at Dome C, we don't actually have much precipitation or snowfall at all, which means if you drill down um, sort of to the core, it means that you don't have to drill so far to go a lot further back in time. But that's an aside. Um, so, White Mars, the, this is what we're often known as by ESA, and there's lots of different reasons for that. Um, as I mentioned, the isolation is certainly one of them, um, but there's also a few others which are really useful for us to use Concordia as a spaceflight analogue. So one of them is we're an international skeleton crew, and so this was my crew that I spent um, the nine month over winter period with. It's about a 50-50 mix between technical team and scientific team, and so there's lots of different researchers down there. And I was the only one working for ESA down there, so all the other um, participants were volunteering for us. Um, but we're international, so we had six um, French and five Italian and myself, so all different languages and also a Swiss-German chap. So that brought in a different mix to, um, compared to sort of a base like British Antarctic Survey where the predominant language is English. And we ended up having our own kind of language which we actually called Concordian, which was a mix of everything. And it really came to light when we had like emergencies. So we were actually very fortunate as a crew, so we didn't have any big emergencies at all. Um, but as you can imagine, even small emergencies in those kind of environments can get out of hand quite quickly. And because it is such an extreme environment, if things do happen then and go wrong, then it's, you know, it's very serious. So to give you an example, we just had a big leak coming through the roof because of a burst water pump. And immediately everybody went back to their sort of native languages and it was absolute chaos in terms of communications. So we learned a lot from those kind of experiences. And we're also isolated for the nine months, but you're also very confined as a crew. So with temperatures at about minus 80 outside, although you can go outside, and a lot of people did most days, you can only go out for short periods of time. So you're actually living sort of on top of each other. And that lives, leads to this kind of forced human interactions, which again is a lot like spaceflight, because you are living in a confined, isolated environment. 
You're also limited with your supplies. So for nine months of the year, we couldn't get anything in or out at all. Um, and it's a big logistical operation to get things in during the summertime. And we actually get that on an overland traverse, which is a big um, land supply train. But unfortunately, if you forget anything, like in space, um, you can't get it <laughs> um, halfway through. So as many of you might know, we've got an abnormal day and night cycle down south. So I actually was 105 days without seeing the sun at all. Um, and then during that period in the summer, the opposite way around, so 24 hour night time. And that affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways. And that was another big thing which ESA are really interested in, uh, especially the effects of the artificial lighting on your eyes and also the way that that affects your sleep-wake cycles. So I've been working up in the Arctic a lot, so I'm really used to sort of 24 hour daytime, and I went down quite smug thinking I'd be absolutely fine um, because it's never affected me, the 24-hour daylight. But the second that we lost the sun, I was all over the place and my sleep-wake cycle went, went to pot and I probably didn't sleep for about the first three days. And that was really interesting for us as a crew because we actually ended up sort of forming subgroups, so we're a crew of 13, and quite typically you form subgroups within that size, and we were actually shifting our sleep-wake cycles um, out of sync with other people, which is a real problem for communication as a crew, um, and so we actually had to enforce having lunch and dinner times together to make sure that we did um, stay sort of in as much of a sort of same circadian rhythm as possible. And Concordia is also an extreme environment. So this is giving you, this is a normal screenshot during a typical winter day. So you can see it's really low temperature, so we've got minus 81.4 there. What you might also notice is that we're actually at very low pressure. So Concordia is actually 3,300 meters altitude. And because we're in a polar environment, that's um, personified because and giving us a sort of alpine equivalent pressure of about 4,000 meters, which is essentially a little bit like living on Mont Blanc for the year. So that affected a lot of people as well. And also you have real danger when you're going outside. So it's cold, dark, um, and so you have to be very careful. And this is, this is what it looked like. And you're also there for a very long time. So I was there for 14 months, and nine months of that was the overwinter period where we didn't see anyone else. And we also have water recycling technology. And this is also developed by ESA, and it is actually one of the original prototypes which was used to develop the current water recycling system, which is now used on the International Space Station. So that meant having to use sort of not normal shampoo or conditioner for an entire year, which for, for the girls amongst us was a bit of a struggle. So you have to use like special things in the shower um, to accommodate for that. We also have really good telemedicine facilities. So if we are thinking of going on longer duration spaceflight missions, we do have to think towards um, a similar medical model to that that we have down in Antarctica. If at the moment um, we have a medical problem up in space, we can evacuate normally within the day. In Antarctica, it's a very different story. So we actually had two medical doctors down there. So it was myself and also an Italian surgeon. And between us, we could more or less deal with most sort of most problems that could come into um, a doctor's surgery. So now I'd like to just um, share with you a little bit of my experience and what, what it was that I was doing down there. Um, so before I went away, I was sent off to Chamonix, um, where I learned from the PGHM, which is the mountain rescue team, about sort of pre-hospital care and retrieval medicine. Um, and I also went to all the different institutes who are running the experiments down um, in Antarctica for ESA. But probably the most important part of my training was actually at the European Astronaut Centre. And so here we are as a crew, uh, meeting for the first time at the Astronaut Centre in Cologne. Um, this is actually at the Neutral Buoyancy Facility. And here we had what's called human behavior performance training. And some of you might know that before astronauts go up into space, they're given a lot of training um, by this team, which is about living and working together in close proximity. And so we were given all the same training um, that astronauts have before they go up into space. Um, so we're really lucky to have this as a crew. And we also got to look around all the training facilities and have a bit of fun as well. So that was really good. Um, and this is astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti, who actually was sort of our mascot for the rest of our mission and called us up from the International Space Station down in Antarctica, which was really, really cool, especially for the Italians amongst the crew. 
Um, but like with any experiment, so we had to do all of the baseline testing before we went away. And this is NVHAB, which is a big um, medical research facility, which is run by the DLR, um, which is just outside of the astronaut center. And this is actually where Tim Peake had all of his testing um, before and after um, going to space. So one of the experiments we're doing is doing functional MRI scanning of our brains before we went down and afterwards, and then again six months after. So I've just had my last one taken in Cologne. And we're looking for any structural changes which might have occurred um, during that isolation period. We also had loads of blood tests and loads of different other tests, and some of them were more fun than others. And I think and this Italian chap particularly enjoyed this one as there were two pretty nurses taking his blood. And these are the bed rest studies. So this is actually where all the bed rest facilities are based as well. So this is the um, other analog that I mentioned before. So once we've done, ooh, sorry. Once we've done all the testing, it was time to go to Antarctica. Um, there's two ways of getting there. You can either go by a boat or you can go by plane. And so on my journey down, I actually went by plane. Um, and this is the Hercules plane, which took me from Christchurch to Antarctica. Um, and then from there, you get a smaller plane, which is called a twin otter plane, um, from the coast to um, the central station at Concordia. I actually got a boat on my way back, and it's, um, that was an amazing experience too. So that's sort of a two-week journey back. So here I am. This is 16,500 kilometers from home. Um, and this is the summertime. So I was like, oh my goodness, when I arrived. <laughs> So pretty chilly. So in the summer times, you're talking about minus 30 at Concordia is the sort of average temperature. But you do have 24-hour daylight and a really low humidity. Um, so it's actually quite comfortable to live in. Um, and this is my predecessor, Adrianos. Um, and he was the ESA doctor before me. And he taught me probably one of the most important things for anybody thinking of doing an overwinter in Antarctica. And that's how to learn baby football. So very useful tip. And then all the food and fuel came during the summer. So this is the Overland Traverse. Um, and this travels from De Montville Station all the way to Concordia, which is 1,300 kilometers. And it does this twice during the summer season. And this is how all the experimental equipment arrives um, from ESA. So this is one of my ESA boxes. And so the summer is a really busy time for setting up all the experiments which we do over winter. ESA are only really interested in that period of isolation. Um, and so that's the main part of our work. We do a little bit before and after, but, but we're really looking at the effects of the crew. Um, and so there's lots of other experiments going on down there. So lots of glaciology lots of digging. And um, this is actually the Epco coring project. So this is um, got actually the one of the oldest, well, the oldest ice core ever drilled, which is 800,000 kilometers, um, 800,000 years old. And this is pretty much what it looks like everywhere at Concordia. So it's completely flat. So you do have sort of sensory deprivation as well. And like Tim Peake said, when he came down from space, you don't actually smell anything in space. And it's similar in Antarctica. There really isn't any smells. So there's no, and that's one of the first things that I noticed when I came back on the ship is just the, you know, the smells that, that are all around us here. And this is like a typical day during the summer. So pretty comfortable outside. Um, and also lots of sport happens as well, so it's, it's actually during that period quite nice busy time. But it's all in preparation for the winter time, so this is learning how to sort of do these um, fire escape, which is like a big sock which comes out of the side of the building, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, but we also learned lots of um, roles. So like, because it's a skeleton crew, you learn lots of shared roles. So although I was there as the ESA doctor, I sort of also learned lots of other things about cooking. I had cleaning jobs. Um, we taught sort of the plumber how to scrub into theatre and vice versa. I was um, taught how to sort of be a fireman. So this is a really busy time for us to take on new skills and learn how to do different stuff. And that's really important as a crew living in that environment is that you are able to take on different roles um, um, and a lot like in space. So this is the last plane leaving, so a pretty emotional time for everybody. Um, and this is actually going away. So, and here we are now as a crew of 13. And this is the beginning of the overwinter. And ESA often call us hivernauts, which hiver in, win in French means winter, so it's sort of winter noughts. Um, and this is the ESA lab, so this is my home. 
um, for 14 months. And I'd like to just give you a bit of a flavor of the experiments that we're doing down there. I can't really cover everything here today, but I, if you'd like to catch me afterwards, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. And do stop me if there's something you'd like to ask. Um, so neuropsychology, this is a big experiment that we were running um, between ESA and NASA, um, and it was developing um, a tool in space which is looking at um, the cognition of astronauts, and it's, it's, um, it's a four-part experiment, but the main part was, um, sorry, a cognition battery. So the idea is that astronauts do it on a regular basis, it looks at lots of different areas, so it's looking at um, risk-taking behavior, memory testing, um, reaction times, um, but essentially it's um, a red flag system. So astronauts are just tested against themselves and any dip in performance is a red flag for mission control to be like, why are they dipping? Are they getting enough food? Are they getting enough exercise, sleep? Are there emotional problems going on? So this is a big thing that we're developing. And that's a really exciting thing about concrete is not only are we looking at the isolation, but also often used to increase subject numbers for experiments which are also happening up in space. And that's because astronauts are very few and far between, and so in order to develop things a bit more quickly um, and to have enough subjects to get a reasonable power for the experiments, um, we're often used to supplement that. And also as part of this experiment was the functional MRI scanning, which I mentioned before, um, and also wearing activity watches. So these activity watches are really useful for not just looking at our general activity levels, but also our sleep-wake cycles um, and how that was changing over time. But perhaps more interestingly, these are also interacting with each other. So my watch would interact with your watch, and so it would know how much time we're spending together as a crew and how our relationships are changing over time. And it would also know where we are on the base. So it's looking at habits, so sort of how often am I going to the gym, how much time am I spending working, and interestingly also, how much time am I spending sort of seeking out social interactions, so in sort of social spaces, for example, the living room, or how much time am I spending um, isolating Isolating myself, and it's really looking at myself, and it's really looking at critical time points in the mission where people are more at risk of isolating themselves, and also to have big arguments and conflicts and um, formation of sub subgroups within the crew. So it's really looking at sort of crew dynamics. And um, we also um, wore a heart monitor, looking at our heart traces, um, and as I mentioned, the cognition battery, which we we're developing. So these are the beacons which we had on the walls, and that's what was actually detecting where our watches were on the base. Um, and here's the cognition battery that we're developing. And here it is also being done at the, exactly the same time by Scott Kelly up in space. And it, excitingly, it's now been taken out of the research phase, and this is actually going to be implemented on the ISS as just part of normal astronaut, astronaut routine um, in the next couple of months. <laughs> Um, another experiment um, is video diary, so again, a bit Big Brother-ish. Um, so we're just um, speaking, doing a video diary once a week, and um, from this we're trying to develop um, technology which can um, pick up non-verbal cues about what we're saying. So it wasn't really looking at the content of what we're saying, but how we we're saying it and whether we can infer from that um, how people are really feeling despite what they're saying. Um, I was also doing an experiment called Backfinder, um, which again was run by the DLR, and this is looking for extreme bacteria that can survive in the environment that we have at Concordia. So with such low temperatures, um, the conditions are really similar to other planets, for example Mars, um, and so if we could find new species of bacteria which are able to survive at Concordia, um, then perhaps this can tell us a little bit more about what perhaps we could find um, on other planets elsewhere. At the moment, we've never found anything to be able to survive at Concordia outside, other than, of course, the humans living there as Nova Winter crew. But we've never found any bacteria outside. So my samples have come back on a ship, and they've only just arrived back in Europe, but fingers crossed we'll have found something exciting there. Um, and this carried on throughout the whole winter, so this is me finding the pole um, where I was taking my samples from. And that's actually a lot harder than I thought. So the first time I went out during the winter, I did what I normally did and just, you know, took my pad, took my equipment. Um, and it really did um, let me know that I was sort of in an extreme environment. So I opened up my pad and the, um, the glue on the 
the spine of the pad just broke completely straight away. All the pages went flying. Um, I took out my experiments to take all the meteor data and all the batteries had run out completely because I'd had them in my rucksack. And my goggles were completely iced up and my fingers were freezing. So I had to go back inside and sort of start again. But it, it really did make me realize how difficult it is to take these kind of data um, in an environment like this. And this was just after doing it. Um, we also um, looked at the effects of artificial lighting on our eyes, and this um, was particularly looking at pupil reactions. Um, and I just like this experiment because it demonstrates how, although all the research is designed by ESA um, and sort of for space flight, um, it's also very relevant to um, a lot of medical research which is happening back in um, England. So, for example, this one um, is really relevant to people working for long periods of time using artificial light, for example, sort of factory workers um, doing a lot of night shifts. So a lot of the experiments, although they're designed towards space, um, are actually relevant to a lot of people. Um, and there, this is just to say that there were lots and lots of other samples as well. So I've actually got a little bowl patch on the back of my head still um, because they took so many hair samples from me as well. So um, it was constant, constant sample time. So um, it's, it's really being the ESA doctor out in Concordia is very much just by like, being Mr. Motivator. So you're constantly asking people um, if they'll donate things um, for you. So um, if anyone's thinking of doing it, be prepared for that. Um, and then this is one more experiment that we were doing. Um, so if we are to go on long duration missions, it's a lot easier to build space flight at slightly lower atmospheric pressure than um, here on Earth. Um, so it's interesting to look at this chronic low level hypoxia. So we're not really interested in sort of what it's like up on the top of Mont Blanc, uh, sorry, Mount Everest, but we are more interested in looking at sort of the pressures that you get around the Mont Blanc, which is what we were at. Um, so this is an arterial blood gas machine, um, and I was taking venous and capillary samples down there, um, looking at sort of our oxygenation status. Um, so this is me at the gym, and this was um, just a few, well, actually the month before I was about to leave. And so I've been here for 14 months, and I definitely acclimatized. I could tell that from my blood. So I was actually alkalotic um, in terms of my pH, which is typical for somebody um, who's acclimatized well. Um, but you can see here, even with a little bit of exercise, I was saturating at 88%. And for anybody that's medical amongst you, um, typically it's supposed to be about 98%. And if I presented to an A&E department with those saturations in England, I would sort of be admitting myself. So you really are having sort of really low oxygenation, even at the end of um, the acclimatization. Um, and this is just to say that um, there's lots of different experiments happening there, and they tend to change each year. So this is a new one that we bought in this summer, and this is um, the Soyuz Spaceflight Simulator. So this is the actual one that we use to train astronauts on. And this has been taken down to Antarctica um, to look at skill re retention over time. So this one, we're training um, crew on different training schedules and looking at sort of what's best um, in terms of retaining skills without putting too much pressure on a crew. And this is also to look at whether we need to be considering taking something like a space flight simulator on a longer duration mission, um, because the last thing you want is your astronauts to arrive at Mars and not be able to land the spaceship. So this is the kind of thing that we're looking at here. Um, and then this is just to give you a bit of an idea about what life um, on base is like other than doing the ESA experiments. Um, so as ESA MD, I was out doing a lot of the medical rescue training. So this is us. Um, and it's a lot harder than you might think to pick up um, a casualty with sort of three different languages and big balaclavas um, and things. So this is a lot of our time we spent training doing things like this. We also do a big evacuation of the entire base during the overwinter as well, which takes um, a couple of days to do. Um, and this is because the temperatures are so low that if we were to have a power failure, um, it would be catastrophic unless we were able to set up the new generators which um, live in the summer camp. So there's lots of, um, lots of other things which you might not sort of think about um, when you're working down um, for an overwinter. Um, I also did the analysis of the um, water that we had down there, so the grey water recycling. Um, and we had lots of problems with people peeing in the shower. So unfortunately, unlike on the ISS, um, we're not able to remove ammonia from the shower. So um, if people do pee in the shower at Concordia, please don't. So it's my advice. <laughs> it's pretty grotty. Um, 
So now, um, lots of my friends and family are just like, why on earth would you want to go to Antarctica for 14 months? So I'd just like to show you some of the pictures and sort of explain why it is a great place to go and sort of do some research. So, um, and the first one is the aurora. So here you can see like a tiny little aurora, which is coming off the left-hand side of the tower there. Um, also, in terms of the social side, um, we did, so this is our chef, Luca, so we actually had an Italian chef there, so I can't complain too much, um, although we didn't have any fresh fruit and vegetables for the entire time that we were there. Um, as part of when you're working down in Antarctica, we have lots of like sort of inter-Antarctic things going on. So we have an inter-Antarctic film festival, um, and we also have an inter-Antarctic darts tournament. So we Skype all the other bases and play darts against each other, essentially. So, <laughs> Um, and halfway through my winter, just after midwinter, um, it was time to Skype um, with Scott Base, which is, um, it's, sorry, South Pole Base. Um, and halfway through the darts match, they brought out a watermelon, which I was absolutely devastated to see because I hadn't had fresh fruit and vegetables um, for all that time. So um, if anyone's thinking of doing a winter, definitely consider going um, to somewhere where they have hydroponic um, plant growing. So um, I was pretty upset by that. Um, but Luca did a great job in terms of every Saturday night, especially we used to have a different sort of meal, and this is the English night that we had going on down there. People often ask me about communication. Um, so we did have internet access, and we could um, Skype as well. So we had one Skype computer down there, um, and if we were doing conferences and things like that, we could dedicate the line to do a good sort of Skype call. Um, so we did we were well communicate. Uh, we were sorry, we did have com good communication in that respect. And um, we also had WhatsApp. So um, we weren't completely isolated, um, but we didn't have sort of internet on individual computers. So you'd sort of have to go to a, a special computer where you could access your emails and things. And it was very slow. I mean, you could sort of check your Google, check your Facebook probably, but you couldn't really browse the internet. So that's the kind of level that we had. Um, during the winter, we did actually have two months where nothing worked at all, so we just had a sat phone. Um, and I'm, I'm still on the fence as to whether it's easier or harder without good communication. So um, when you have good communication, it is great. So if you have an argument or something, um, you can quickly sort of, you know, WhatsApp back home and then be on Skype in not too long, which, which was great. Um, but also it's quite hard to sort of detach yourself from home and sort of um, form as a crew. So a lot of the time, you know, on a Saturday night, a lot of my friends would send me sort of selfies on nights out in London. And, you know, you did sort of consider, oh, <laughs> Why am I sat here in the middle of Antarctica on my own? Um, so, and then during the period where we didn't have any communications, you don't have any of that sort of external pressure. And also you can have bad news and things coming from home which puts pressure on the crew and sort of relationship breakdowns and things as well. And so some people actually find it a lot easier during that time where we didn't have any communications with the outside world. So, um, I'm, yeah, I haven't really decided wh which was easier, but they definitely both have their, their pros and cons. Um, and this is just to remind me that lots of um, science goes on all year there. And th these are some of the guys, really dedicated scientists, um, who are going out absolutely every day to take all these snow samples and things um, outside. So as ESA doc, you only have to go outside sort of once a month. I did go outside a lot more than that, but um, sort of in terms of the job description, that's all you have to do. Um, but these guys were going out sort of absolutely every day and sort of climbing up big towers which were 40 meters high and sort of minus 80 conditions. So, so there's lots of great science going on in Antarctica. Um, at Concordia in particular, we have Sismo Caves, which is look for seismic activity underground. So occasionally you get to go inside them when they're doing um, sort of changes to the experiment. So this is um, inside them and they're really weird. You can sort of write on the wall and it glows through. Um, and we also have big lasers going off, so um, these are called LIDARs, um, and they're sort of testing the atmosphere, as a lot of you might already know. Um, but this was the night sky, and so this, was, this photo was actually taken around lunchtime, um, and this is really what it looked like all the way through the winter period. So it really was, you could see the Milky Way clear as day at any time, so it's the sort of stargazer's paradise. Um, during the sort of at the either end of the um, period where we didn't see the sun, you did actually um, see it kind of looked a little bit like the sun had just set at the horizon. So you have like that little glow at the edge that so you could kind of tell whether it was day or night. But during the middle of the winter, like there was absolutely no way I could tell you what kind of, you know, what day it was. 
Um, and, and it is strange how we did shift in terms of patterns. And it, and it really was only our lunch and dinner which did keep us together as a crew during that period. And it wasn't an intentional thing. You know, as a crew, we were, you know, relatively on good terms all together. But it, you just sort of naturally shift. And sort of the scientists tend to work better at sort of later on at night time, um, whereas sort of technical team, you tend to have more of a structured day sort of working together. So it really did form a big problem. We can definitely see that on the data, that big shift that happened. Um, but these and these are some of the auroras we had um, down there as well. So pretty beautiful. Um, and this is the sun that came back. So this is the first time we'd seen the sun. So really emotional time for everybody. And you really did feel the energy levels just soar through the roof when this came. So um, during the winter, it's like really hard to sort of motivate you, yourself to do anything. Back here in England, I'm sort of running to and fro from lots of different places and always really busy. Um, go to the gym, exercise regularly, you know, those kind of things. Whereas actually, you, you really slow down. You feel like you're kind of hibernating a little bit. And even writing an email is, is like a massive struggle. Um, but as soon as the sun came back, we really did all feel energized. Um, and then this is what it kind of looks like um, for most of the other times. So you get this weird pinky purple. Um, and the, the sort of purpley gray that you can see there um, is apparently um, the shadow of the earth that you can see as you're rotating around, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is the plane that came back to, to get us. And this is Jim. So he's a pilot that works out in Antarctica um, every year for, I think, the past 15 years. And he was actually involved in the um, recent evacuation that you might have heard of um, at the South Pole base as well. So he's, it's really people like this which um, managed to keep everything running. Um, and I was very grateful that he didn't get lost on the way back when he came to, came to pick me up. And um, here I am on the day. So. And this was another point that I noticed was, um, so people which weren't coping so well with the overwinter period and the isolation actually got on the first plane out of Concordia. So um, it wasn't that initial plane that came in, but it was the plane sort of a few days afterwards. And so they had a massive um, shock between sort of going from sort of the isolation of the overwinter period into sort of normal society, as it were. Um, so, but the people who were coping a little bit better actually had a more prolonged um, sort of reintroduction back to sort of normal life. So it, it was quite interesting to see how the, and, and how people were coping going back into sort of seeing people. And some people actually resented the first plane coming back because they felt like it was a big sort of invasion of their home. So it was interesting to see psychologically how um, that affected people. And also the loss of roles within the base. So our station leader um, was obviously our station leader during the winter period, but he was superseded by somebody who came during the summer. And there's lots of conflict and friction um, with those big changes that happen. And this brings me to the last part of my story in Antarctica. Um, so as part of the ESA experiment backfinder, I actually had the opportunity to go on the overland resupply traverse, which I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, so the big land train. Um, and so we went here from Cap Prudhomme, which is um, the little red dot on the, the coast there. Um, and this is where we set up all of the traverse and we drove um, back to Concordia Station. So I flew to Cap Prudhomme um, to drive back. And these are the, some of the guys who, again, are working in Antarctica year after year and really are the lifeblood um, for all the experiments um, and everything which is going down, on down there. So and he's a really grateful to the, all these guys who um, managed to keep all the experiments running. And it's a lot, again, it's a lot like spaceflight. You know, there's a huge teams behind um, all the experiments and all the astronauts going up into space. And so this is just to, just to show you all the guys that sort of dedicated their lives. I mean, some of these guys have worked for like 10 over winters in Antarctica. Um, um, and most of these guys working on the Traverse had done about 15, um, 15 or 20 years down there, so, uh, so big periods of time. So these are some of the guys that I was fortunate enough to work with. So, uh, yep. And then they kindly added me to their team. Um, so it's not all glamorous working for ESA, so I was here um, for two days changing um, the screws on a caterpillar track tractor. Um, so it's all different roles that you got to get involved with, which was something that I really enjoyed. Um, and in true French style, I was given sort of half an hour driving lesson, which would involve sort of driving on these huge Challenger tractors sort of around um, a little circuit. They put on an L plate on the back of mine, um, and then we were off across the Antarctic Plateau. Fortunately, there's not too much that you can crash into um, other than the other tractors, so it wasn't so bad. Um, 
And here we are. See, this is um, the land train. It's quite hard to get the whole thing into the pictures. Um, to, in terms of how it works, you've got two Challenger tractors, which are these huge tractors which are made specifically for the Traverse, or modified for the Traverse. Um, and so you drive in tractor pairs, and we had four sets of tractor pairs, so eight big Challenger tractors, and each tractor pair is driving sort of tied up to each other, so you have one, a big piece of rope, a second one, and then a huge amount of weight and equipment behind it on these sort of special skis. And these um, little um, trailers here, these are actually the ones which carry the fuel. Um, and so this is how we drive across. We also have three snow plows. So you have one snow plow right at the beginning, one in the middle, and then one at the back as well. And the snow plows come and help you out if anything happens. So they're sort of very maneuverable, um, whereas the big um, tractors sort of go in a, in a massive line. Um, so, and that's how it works. So here I am inside my tractor, a bit of a, a tractor selfie there. Um, and this is in my tractor. So I spent Christmas and New Year's this year um, driving in one of these tractors. Um, so this was, yeah, the 2nd of January that this was taken. And you can see in front of there that, um, so we were the tractor pair there, so that was my pair. Actually, when you go from the coast, you drive as a pair, well, not a pair at all, three tractors, so it's even more, because actually the initial bit from the coast is a lot steeper, so we sort of drive as three for that first day, um, just in case you're interested. <laughs> Um, and also I got to experience some of the bad weather that you have in Antarctica. You're quite, sort of, although the temperatures are really low at Concordia, you don't actually see very bad weather at all. The skies are always really clear because you don't have that precipitation, you don't actually have much wind at all. Um, but it's certainly not the case at the coast. Um, so the temperatures are actually a lot, low, um, a lot higher at the coast, um, but you do get to see all these sort of exciting storms, and this is one that we are driving through. And this is actually my tractor, tractor number six. So, but you do have your problems. So this is how I spent New Year's Eve, actually. Um, so this all came off the sort of um, road that we had built. Um, so the French said that this was the Italians. The Italians said that it was the French. As long as it wasn't the Brit, I didn't really care. So um, this, this is how we did that. Um, and then these are, yeah, this is just the, the tractors. So at night time, you... Um, park up all the tractors together and we sort of plug them into an electricity supply as well. So that's how they don't um, freeze overnight. Um, but the reason I was doing this experiment is I was taking snow samples um, during the whole length of the traverse. And we we're looking at the transition between where we do find bacteria at the coast um, and animals obviously surviving. So you've got all the penguins and things um, at the coast to somewhere like Concordia where we don't have any life um, surviving there at all. And so we are looking, um, and it's also the traverse provides us with the pristine, untouched environment, because this traverse only happens two times a year, and so if you go off the track just a little bit, you're walking in sort of part of Antarctica that's never been walked in before. Um, so it's really exciting opportunity to be able to take sort of snow samples from this virgin snow, which was um, a real sort of pleasure to get to do. Okay. Um, and then it was home time. So um, this is the boat that I got back, so it's called the Italica, um, and I got back that back to Christchurch. So I'd like to spend the rest of my um, talk um, just going through any questions that anybody has, um, which hopefully you do have. Yes. Um, did you find the behavior and location tracking sort of oppressive? which I imagine it would in an ordinary job if, you, if people knew where you were all the time and were analysing it. It must affect your behaviour as well, surely? Well, I thought that might be the case at the beginning, um, but the way we were tracking people was using um, watches. I mean, obviously everybody was consented to the experiment, so everybody knew what the watches are for and what we're doing with them and the fact that we are tracking people. Um, but you are down there wearing these watches for 14 months, um, and so sort of after a few weeks, I think most of us kind of forgot really that we were even being tracked at all. And certainly, you know, I don't think I changed my habits because of it. I mean, I think at some points you did, I did wonder, especially because obviously I'm working for ESA who are running the experiment. I mean, they know how often you're spending in the lab and like how often you're spending working and where you are doing, doing things. Um, but it was all confidential in terms of um, 
sort of what we found. So I think because nobody on the base um, got sort of direct feedback in terms of sort of their habits and what they were doing, um, I don't think it really affected the crew. But obviously, I mean, that is a limitation with all experiments um, that you are doing with people because we do know that we're being tracked or doing experiments on. I think... I don't think the tracking one was really affected by that. I think the one um, which was probably more affected would have been the um, koala, which is the video diaries. I think people felt a lot more self-conscious doing that. Um, having said that, um, with something like koala, um, again, you're looking for non-verbal cues, and, and astronauts would also have some similar pressures in terms of that they know that they're being um, watched and sort of analyzed as well when they're talking to mission control. So, I mean, it's, diff it's difficult to say, um, but I think just because we were wearing them all the time for so long, I think that people did kind of forget um, that they were wearing them. And there's also th some things which you can't really modify in terms of, you know, your sleep-wake cycle as well, which we were um, able to get data from. But we were really lucky to get that data because it's quite hard to get ethics for that kind of experiment, and it's one of the few that have ever been able to um, actually get that um, on a platform, on a sort of a research platform. So it's quite a unique data set in that respect. Yeah. I can see Sorry, I can see we've got a few more questions. Unfortunately, for time, we haven't got time to ask them here right now. But would you mind, Beth, asking, or yeah, answering that's fine. questions outside yeah. just afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. So no if anyone's got any questions, please ask afterwards. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your talk. <laughs>